Okay, it's time to open in prayer. Give us all to stand if you can, and thank, thank God for the day. Dear Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, that we can come assemble here with your people. God, to honor you and worship you. God, to hear the word of God. And Lord, to fellowship afterwards. Pray that the Lord bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
I thought they were going to Tennessee, but they're going to Virginia. And hopefully, they've made it there today. Remember them? Remember the Reverend Chuck family? We had a great, great meeting yesterday. <laughs> good to, good to. Remember us, her brother Dave? Also, Remember Terry too. Terry, she had a very unique problem that seems to not go away. I, I, I believe that she needs a miracle. Really, she needs a miracle. <laughs> yes. Remember the service today? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Jesus. We're here, Lord, on this beautiful day. God, to worship you, lift up your name. We God, we pray today. Lord, for these needs of God, the family has lost this young girl, Lord, tragically. And God, we pray, that you, Lord, you comfort their hearts. Lord, remember Sister Ramachak's brother Dave, Lord, in this situation. God, we continue to pray, Lord, for our brother Frank Ramachak. God, we thank you for what, Lord, has, how he has come so far, Lord. We thank you, God, for all your miracles, Lord, for this people in this house. Dear Jesus, we pray, dear God, for those, Lord, who need to be filled with your spirit. God, that your spirit will be poured out in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. So you may be seated. Now with our announcements, there will be no service this evening. Please join us after this service for barbecue and potluck. And coming up this week is actually small groups. God bless our small groups. So now I, uh, I'll introduce her. Another song. Oh, another song? Okay, sorry. I don't know why I don't <laughs> we can wait. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurry. Sorrow. I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek help and pray this for you. I pray for your healing that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside. Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I speak the name. that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I speak the name of all
every promise he is faithful to keep i speak the name no grave could ever hold he is greater he is stronger he's the god of possible i pray for your healing that circumstances would change i pray that the fear that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come believe it, come receive it. Oh, the power of going to happen after the service, <laughs> but I'm also looking forward to what God has for us in the service today. It's always a joy to be here for those of you who may be guests or visiting. I'm not the pastor, so don't judge the church based on me today. <laughs> if you're new, you owe it to yourself to be back at some point when the Tracys are here. You're some of the most wonderful people on earth. I just love Pastor and Sister Tracy, and I'm trusting I'm not alone in that this morning. Can I praise God? They have just been such good friends, and, uh, and I know you feel that too. Amen. I, I, I like kind of geeking out over the Bible. <laughs> I like studying and finding some things that maybe aren't perfectly clear upon a first reading, but catches your eye and you think there's something more there. Amen. It's a great thing about the Bible is 25 years ago when I first walked into a church for the first time in my life, the Bible was understandable to me. I was able to read it 
and understand what I needed to do for my next steps. But 25 years later, and for some of you a lot longer than 25 years later, the Bible still speaks. It's still alive. It's still revelatory. And that's a powerful thing about this great Word of God. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning about something that just came across in my studies. I've been kind of really digging into the first five books of the Bible this summer. That's just where God's been leading me. And so something I stumbled over that I want to speak to you about this morning. Praise God. Thank you, brother. I'm not going to sing. So anytime you feel this, step out. Praise God. You ever had somebody give you a compliment that shortly after you realized wasn't much of a compliment after all? <clears throat> Last year, I had a, an opportunity, uh, a year and a half ago, to, to visit Toronto and to preach at one of their uh, annual conferences, the annual mission conference there at uh, the great, one of the great churches in Toronto. And it was because they couldn't get Americans in, so they were looking for people to fill in, and they, they called me, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I gladly accepted and, and really enjoyed myself. And it's a great multicultural city, as most of you know, and a great multicultural church. And Sunday night, I was just kind of doing my thing, kind of running the altars, dancing, shouting, kind of just praising Jesus with everything I had. And I had a dear elder sister from Jamaica originally, and she came up to me after service, and I'm all sweaty, and she's all sweaty because she's been in the altar worshiping, and I just was a mess. And she said, Brother, I just want to say you got moves. <laughs> and then she said, For a white guy. <laughs> And I thought, okay, well, sounded like a compliment, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure with that qualifier if this is still a compliment or not. And so this morning, I I'm going to do kind of just the opposite of that for you today. I'm going to maybe insult you, <laughs> and then if you give me some time, you'll realize it's actually a compliment. Okay. So I'm warning you, okay, and this is not my fault. I won't name any names, but we can blame our tech team. She, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. She, the tech team asked me for a title, and so it's really the tech team's fault, not my fault. So if, you, if you're insulted by this, see them after service, not me. But today I, I want to I make this declaration. Now remember what I've already told you. It's going to get better, okay? But I'm going to preach to you on, you are a donkey. Okay? Anybody insulted yet? Tech team, remember. If you're insulted, talk to the tech team. Praise God. You are a donkey. We're going to turn to Deuteronomy 6 and 8 and just pull a quick verse out of here. And then we're going to open the scriptures a little bit more. Deuteronomy 6 and 8, and it says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Praise God. Would you just close your eyes and lift up your voice and pray with me for a moment? I'm going to ask you to lift your voice. I need to get a little drink so I don't dry out. But let's pray together in the name of Jesus. God, help us this morning. Bless us in this time together as we open your word and we look upon, God, what you have to say to us today. And I pray, Lord, you'd anoint this speaker, this vessel, God, Lord, to be able to deliver what you've been speaking to me, God. I pray you'd speak it through me this morning, God, and bless us, minister to us, and let your will be done in Jesus' name. Praise God. And just to welcome his presence here, would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. This little verse that we pulled out, it, uh, it's a bit of an obscure verse. There's only four that kind of are similar to it in all of the Bible. It's referring to the Tephilim. It's, it's a, a custom among certain Orthodox Jews that 
at certain times of day and certain times of year, they will take a little box, the Tefillim, two little boxes, and they're, these boxes are made of black leather, and inside of those boxes there are parchments, little scrolls with Hebrew verses written on them. And these Jewish men will take those boxes and, as the scripture says, bind them to themselves. They will take one box, put it on their non-dominant arms bicep, bicep and wrap leather strands around it all the way down their arm, all the way down their middle finger. So they're literally binding the word of God to their arms. They'll take the second box and put it on their forehead directly where the, the hairline, and for some of you that'll be way back, but, but where the hairline <laughs> meets the forehead, and they take that leather box and take leather straps and they bind it to their head. They're literally fulfilling the word of God. Bind it to your arm. Bind it to your head. And they will meditate and pray and feel the presence of God as they wear these tefillin, the phylacteries in, uh, in Greek. It's a way for them to connect with God and to keep his commandment both close to their mind. That makes sense, binding a box to your head. <laughs> keep it close to your mind. And the idea of binding it to the arm is to keep it close to your heart because as you bind that box to your bicep, as you walk and move, that is directly beside your heart. And so they keep the command of God by saying, we're going to keep these laws close to our mind and close to our heart. We're going to get there, but that kind of sounds like something we've been told in other places in the Bible, to keep these things in our mind with all our mind and with all of our heart. So it's a reminder of God's law, not the total law, you couldn't take a scroll <laughs> with all of the five first books of Moses, the law of God. You couldn't take the Torah and put it inside a box and bind it to your head. There's no way you could walk around with that. There's no way you could bind that to your arm. But these little boxes, just, just under an inch and a half by an inch and a half by an inch and a half, or for those younger than me, like 3.5 centimeters by 3.5 centimeters by 3.5 centimeters. Just the small boxes. So it's not all the law. It's just a few verses that are inside these boxes. And so I want to ask you a quick question. If you were God and you were going to tell your people to take four laws and write them on parchment, and bind them to their bodies so that they were always close to their heart and to their head. Just four laws. Huh. What laws would you pick? And how would you decide which laws to choose? And I think most of us would agree we'd pick ones that were important. Right? The Torah contains 613 laws written to God's people, the Jewish people. But here we're just picking four. <laughs> four out of 613, and you're going to bind them to your head, and you're going to have them close to your heart by binding them to your arms. It seems to me that God is saying, these four laws <laughs> are pretty important. Not negating the other 609 or the remainder, but these four, these four are pretty special. They're pretty important. And so I was curious, what, what four laws is it that God chose to give this great honor to, this place of importance that he always wanted his people to have them on their mind and on their heart? First one makes sense. It's kind of a no-brainer, actually, when we think about the big laws of the Old Testament. It's in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Elohim, Yehovah Ahad. It's the Shema. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. 
The Lord your God is one. It's an important thing for us to remember. And I thank God that thousands of years after these verses were written, we gather today in a church that still believes there's one God. Amen. That there's none like him. That there's none beside him. That he alone is the great I am, the creator of all things. Hallelujah. There's one God. And it's easy for us to stand beside the Jewish believers and say, that's an important law. That's something you don't want to forget. It's something you want to bind to your head. <laughs> something you want to have close to your heart is always remember he's one. None other God beside him. We're going to serve him. He alone is worthy. Amen. And another law that's, that's in that box, that tefillin, it's another one that's familiar to most of us, and we find it in Deuteronomy 11. And verse 13 says, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day. Here's what you got to remember. Love the Lord your God, and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then down in verse 18, the commandment was, You shall lay these words upon your heart and bind them as a sign on your hand, on your arm, next to your heart, that they may be frontlets between your eyes. Put that right between your eyes on your forehead. There's that same commandment, second time we see it. God said, This is important. This is important. you got to love me with all your heart, <laughs> with all your soul. And the important thing here, he says, you've got to love me and serve me with all your heart and with all your soul. That sounds important. <laughs> and it should. We... we hear a paraphrase of it continued in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 22 and, and verse 37. Jesus gives us these words, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Jesus is asked to the Pharisees, What is the greatest law? And he says, You've got to love God. You've got to love God. You gotta love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. But as you read Jesus' quotation from the old into the new, there are two slight differences in this verse. First of all, Jesus adds, You have to love God with all your mind. We didn't see that in the Old Testament. But again, Jesus is giving some instruction. He's just, he's not changing the meaning. He's just giving clarification. And so it was in the Old Testament, God said, you've got to love me with all your heart and all your soul, and you've got to take that commandment and bind it to your mind. And Jesus just paraphrases and says, you've got to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Okay, he's not changing the word of God. But there's another little difference here in that Jesus not only adds a slightly different phrasing, but he leaves out a part of the Old Testament phrasing, which said, you got to love God and serve him with all your soul and all your heart. But it's not that Jesus forgot. <laughs> Again, he's adding clarification. Because to serve God means to represent him well. And so Jesus says, there's a second great commandment, and it's connected to the first, and it is this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He says, if you love God, you've got to serve. You've got to love people. The two are connected forever. You can't have one without the other. It says later in the New Testament, if you say you love God who you've not seen, but you can't love your brethren and the people around you who you have seen. If you want to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you got to love people. 
Well, I would hope that would go over better in a church. But yeah, <laughs> you got to love people. Right. Amen. So it's an important law. Love God. Love others. Okay? You only got four. You only got room for four in this box. So number one, there's one God. Don't ever forget it. Number two, you got to serve God with everything. You got to love him with everything you have. And you got to love people. It's important. Third law, potentially just as important and certainly to the Jewish people, it's in the book of Exodus, chapter number 13, and it's really in the first 10 verses, but we'll just read a couple verses here. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And then down in verse 9 it says, And this shall be a sign unto thee upon thy hand and a memorial between thine eyes <laughs> that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. He's saying, you got to remember the firstborn belong to me. And it's a reminder that I brought you out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. And you have a responsibility to teach that lesson to your children and your children's children. That every generation will remember, I am the God who redeems my people. You must never forget that you were in slavery in Egypt and I have brought you out. He says you've got to put this in the Teflim. You've got to remember it. You've got to keep it in your mind that I've redeemed you. You've got to keep it in your heart that I have redeemed you. You've got to remember that, Israel, you are my people. It's important. Everybody with me so far? You only got place for four laws in this tiny box. And God says, okay, here's three. <laughs> One God. Love people, love me and love people. You are my people. I brought you out of slavery. Don't ever forget it. Now, what do you think God would say is number four? Well, this is where things get interesting. <laughs> because this uh, fourth part <laughs> this of these big four, the big four out of 613, the first three make so much sense, but number four God says, I want you to bind to your head, and I want you to bind it close to your heart. Never forget the law of the broken neck donkey. And some of you have been in church for 70 years, and you're like, what is the law of the broken neck donkey? But these are God's big four. Don't ever forget one God. Okay, these are, these are on par. These are going in the box for your head and for your heart. There's one God. Love God. Love people. Don't forget you've been redeemed. And the law of the broken neck donkey. <laughs> one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> going back to my Sesame Street days. God says this in Exodus 11. Sorry, Exodus 13. Uh, starting at verse 11. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and unto thy fathers, and shall give it to thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall it be the Lord's. Now that's all remembering what he just said a few verses before. Right, but now verse number 13. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. And verse 16 tells us this shall be a token upon thy hand and for the frontlets between thine eyes. This is the fourth law God wants you to put in the box. This is number four in the list of big four. 
don't ever forget. Now, God already said a few verses before, all the firstborn animals are mine. But he means clean animals, kosher animals, animals that were within the law for the Jewish people to own and to eat and to have in their possession. But a donkey, <laughs> a donkey is an unclean animal. You can't give what is unclean to God. He's the God of holiness, the God of perfection. What's on clean has nothing to do with his kingdom. Hmm. I don't know why this is in the box. I don't know why this is in the big four. But in God's mind, this belongs here with those other three. And that got me thinking. <laughs> Maybe there's something more here <laughs> than you see at first. Firstborn donkeys, according to the law, it seems like should be God's already, but because they're unclean, they can't be given to him. But of all the unclean animals, hundreds, thousands we could name, unclean animals, there's only one that can be redeemed. The donkey. Only the donkey can be redeemed. Why the donkey. And let me tell you, you can go down some wormholes on this one. <laughs> but basically, as we study Midrash and we study teachings of the, the rabbis, <laughs> they, they say there's two reasons God said the donkey of all the unclean animals can be redeemed. They say, number one, it's because he's God and he makes the rules and we can't question it. <laughs> There you go. There's a <laughs> when you don't have an answer for something, <laughs> quote the rabbis and just say, he's God, who am I to question? And, okay, we'll put that one behind us. The second one gets a little more interesting. They say, most likely the reason God said the donkey of all the unclean animals may be redeemed is because when God's people were leaving Egypt, and he had promised to their father Abraham that when they leave slavery, they will leave in wealth and in riches. That the lowly donkeys carried the wealth from Egypt into the promised land. And God said, because they helped my people and because they carried the treasure, I will honor them among all the unclean animals. It's an interesting thought, especially when we realize that not only did the donkeys carry the treasure from Egypt into the promised land, but, but the donkey, the lowly donkey, would carry God's greatest treasure. In Zechariah 9 and 9, the prophet said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, Thy king, the Messiah, cometh unto you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And then we see in, uh, I said Luke 12, but it's actually John 12. Sorry about that. John 12, 12 to 14, the fulfillment of the prophetic promise. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he'd found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. As Jesus makes his way into Jerusalem, God's greatest treasure is being carried by a donkey into the fulfillment of God's promise. The first treasure that was on the donkey as they came out of Egypt, that treasure was used and melted down to build a house for God to live in. But this second treasure, this great treasure riding on the donkey was God in flesh, God among us. It was Emmanuel, Jesus, 
God with us. God's greatest treasure. Some interesting parallels with the donkey. So what's this all about? Why does God in his list of big four say, <laughs> one God, love me and love people, remember your mind and you are redeemed, and don't forget the law of the broken neck donkey. Can I remind you of my insult? <laughs> it's because you are a donkey. That's why this law is so important. It's because you are a donkey. This story, it's about you. And it's about me. It's these laws that God said, never forget, never let them out of your heart. They're not just uh, to be kept at the forefront of Jewish thought, but they're a foreshadowing of what God was going to do through us. Four most important things to know. And God said, never, never forget that I will redeem an unclean animal. I will redeem a donkey. And one day I will redeem an unclean people. A people that were not mine, but I have chosen them. And I will redeem them. I will redeem the Gentiles. I will redeem us. I will redeem those born outside of the promise. I know the law says they're unclean. But I will redeem them. Why? Why would he do it? The Bible tells us Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. But those that receive the gospel, the good news, these Gentiles like you and I, those people that are not Jewish believers, but the rest of us outside of that Abrahamic covenant, we become the donkey that carries the good news of Jesus to the world. We are the donkey that Zechariah prophesied about that would bring the Messiah to the world and bring forth the redemption of nations. Amen. The church Amen. is the donkey. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. How could the donkey be redeemed? We read it. There's only one way. It's only one way to save that donkey. That's to kill a lamb. The only way to redeem that one unclean animal was the sacrifice of a lamb. A lamb that was born without fault, without blemish, but had to die to redeem the donkey. And when God looked at us, he said, there's only one way to redeem an unclean people. I'm going to sacrifice a lamb in their place. The Bible says Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundations of the world. Paul tells us that God purchased this church with his own blood. Hallelujah. We've been redeemed by the blood of a lamb. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ at Calvary brings forth our redemption. A simple message I want to bring this morning to you and what somebody I feel in my spirit needs to understand today is the law of the broken neck donkey must never be forgotten. It must never leave our hearts or our minds. Because the law of the broken neck donkey gave the owner of the donkey a choice. When the donkey is born, you have a choice. Kill the lamb or kill the donkey. There's no other option. You've got to kill the lamb or you got to kill the donkey. So if you were the farmer or if you were the 
farm hand or the shepherd and in your flock and in your, on your farm a new donkey is born. You had a choice to make. You had to evaluate the value of the donkey. And you had to examine the value of the lamb. And you had to decide which will die. Will the donkey die and the lamb will live? Or will the lamb die and the donkey can live? If you could buy a donkey in the market for 10 shekels, but a lamb you could sell for 15 it would become a no-brainer. You keep the lamb, you sell it, you take the money, buy a donkey, <laughs> and keep the profit. You wouldn't let the lamb die if it was more valuable than the donkey. The farmer only sacrificed the lamb when he decided the donkey is worth the sacrifice. The donkey is worth the sacrifice. Someone here this morning needs to understand that the only reason that Jesus laid down his life at Calvary, the only reason the Lamb of God was sacrificed and shed his blood is because when God looked at you and he looked at me, he decided the donkey is worth the sacrifice. The donkey is worth the sacrifice. The donkey is worth the sacrifice. Your life is not pointless. Your life is not worthless. Your life is not aimless or without value. God determined he examined you and decided you were worth the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. You were worth coming from heaven to earth. You were worth the ridicule. You were worth the lashes on the back. You were worth the crown of thorns. You were worth the shedding of blood. You were worth the six hours of suffering by crucifixion on Calvary's hill. God looked at you and said, it might be a donkey. It might be unclean. They might not have been born into my covenant. But they're worth the sacrifice. They're worth the sacrifice. You have great value in the eyes of God. You were worth everything. You were worth the sacrifice of the lamb. He chose for the lamb to die so that you might live life more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can't get away from this in my spirit over the last few days because I just feel like someone or maybe more than one, maybe many, I don't know, but I feel like somebody needs this reminder of the law of the broken neck donkey. Don't let it get out of your head. Don't let it get out of your heart that you have value in the eyes of God. I know there's some here this morning because I felt it in the Holy Ghost. There's some here this morning who struggle with self-worth. But Jesus' sacrifice says you have value to God. And that's short selling it. You have great value value to God. He decided you were worth the sacrifice of the lamb. Don't ever let that get out of your head or out of your heart. You've got to remember your value is not found in who your parents are or what you've done or haven't done in your past. 
Your value is not found in your ability or your strength or your perfection in the eyes of others. Your value has only one source today, and that's in the sacrifice of the Lamb. God determined you were worth the sacrifice, and that alone determines your value in God's eyes and in God's kingdom. I'm not more valuable because I'm preaching here this morning, and you're no less valuable because of some struggle you may have. Your value is determined by the death of the Lamb. You have value to him and value to the kingdom of God. And no one, hear me, no one has the right to tell you otherwise, including yourself. No one, including yourself, has the right to convince you that you have no value to God. He gave it all to redeem you. You can't get on social media and allow it to make you feel less than somebody else. You can't get around so-called friends who like to rib and tease but are really tearing you apart inside, but you smile and laugh your way through it because you don't want to lose your social connections. You can't let them make you feel less than somebody else. You can't allow the voices of your family to determine that you'll never be something or you'll always be something. That's a lie. It's a lie. God has redeemed you. You have value. You have purpose. You can't let anyone define you or cause you in any way to think of yourself as less than who God has called you to be. Bind it to your head. Bind it to your heart that you are a child of God that's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You may be a donkey. I am a donkey. But the sacrifice says, the sacrifice of Jesus says that this donkey has a place in God's family. The sacrifice of Jesus says that this donkey has a place in God's kingdom. And the sacrifice of the lamb says that this donkey has value in God's eyes. Never let it leave your mind or your heart. You are the donkey, but you've been redeemed by the blood of a lamb. You can't let others dictate over your life saying negative things. You can't let that happen. You're not unlovable. Jesus loves you enough to die for you. You're not junk. You're not a mistake. You are his. He's created you fearfully and wonderfully. You have value to him. I don't know who may have told you things like you're not pretty enough or smart enough or spiritually strong enough, but Jesus at Calvary, by the action of laying down his life, declared once and for all that you are Worthy. You are worthy. Others may see you as the donkey. You may see yourself as the donkey, but never let it leave your heart or your mind that when the Heavenly Father examined you, he said, that donkey's worth the death of my lamb. That donkey's worth the sacrifice of my lamb. Oh, Jesus. Working at our Bible college, I have a pleasure of working with so many young people and and I know this is a struggle for for many of this current generation but it's not their struggle alone we can't kid ourselves and pretend that this is a a, a new generational problem 
About two months ago, I had a man come to me after a service, an elder. He said, Brother, I have a question for you. Do you think I'll go to hell if I ask for assisted suicide? I just don't know if I can handle this anymore. An elder in the church, a man of God who's lived his life for Jesus and his kingdom, has just so much pain in his body and in his mind that it just broke my heart. It's not a 20-something problem. Even in our every church, every Christian needs to bind it to our heads and bind it to our hearts. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and we have value, and we have purpose today because of what he did 2,000 years ago. Another precious elder recently came to me, and in conversation with him, he said, I just pray that God will take me home soon. He said, I just feel so useless. Spent my life working in the kingdom and doing things and helping people, and now I'm old and I'm weak and I can't do what I used to do, and I just wish God would take me home because I have no purpose. I thought, my God, help us. Help us, Lord, to remember our value is not found in strength of body. Our value is not found in our feelings. Our value is not found in what we're able or not able to do today. Our value is found in one thing and one thing alone. The Father said... You're worthy of the redeeming sacrifice of the Lamb of God. You're worthy of redemption. As we stand this morning, and as we come to a close, I know our music team can help us out. God said, I've only got room in that box for four laws. Only four times did he say, bind it to your arm and to your forehead. He said, my people never, never forget there's one God. Never let it escape your mind and your heart that you need to love me and love people. Never forget Never forget that my people have been redeemed and released from Israel. But the fourth one, so important. He said, never forget the law of the broken neck donkey. Never forget that in all the unclean animals, I looked and found one. And amongst a land of unclean people he looked and he found you and he found me and he examined us like the farmer would examine the donkey and God said there's only one way to redeem these people and I judge them to be worthy of the sacrifice of the lamb Never forget that, church. Let it be in your mind and in your heart at all times. You were unclean, but Jesus, Jesus laid down his life not just to save you, but that you might know you have value in God's kingdom. I want you to raise your hands all over this place, and as we spend the last few moments together in worship. I want you to let the love of God sweep over you this morning. If you need to find a place to pray and just get a hold of God and say, oh, I know God that I've struggled with this. I know I've wrestled with this. 
that God, I make a pledge that that I'm going to bind it to my head and I'm going to bind it to my heart, this law of the broken neck donkey. I'll never forget, God, when my circumstance and my thinking causes me to, to feel like I have no value or purpose. I'll remember, God. I'll remember that the lamb was sacrificed that the donkey might be redeemed. That's it, that's it. The worship team's going to take over to just reach out to God however you feel to this morning. There is power.
break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. song if um, I just feel in the spirit if there's something that you need just reach out right now in your life and the Lord is going to it's going to be there and meet that need Thank you, the weapon may be forms but it won't prosper when the darkness falls it won't serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle.
service to a close, but I know many people are looking forward to what is downstairs. We will be back here again Sunday, 10 a.m. for prayer, 10.30 for service. Join us next Sunday evening, 6 p.m. for prayer, 6.30 p.m. for service. Um, Tuesday, 7 o'clock downstairs here for a small group and several others around the city. So if you're closer to the north side, you can join us or... Um, or elsewhere, just let us know. Um, Brother Justin, will, would you uh, bless the food that we're about to uh, partake of? Amen.